All right. Lot, lost you guys. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Uh, can everybody uh, hear me okay? Anybody not hear me? Okay, everybody's okay so far. I got a thumbs up. All right, so we can hear you. Yep. All right, thank you. I'm I'm running a hotspot. I'm running on my phone because I just told Cox. Bye. <laughs> you know, I don't know what to do. Is we it just it's an old apartment complex. And I think the Cox wiring is not the best in the world. Okay, well, uh, let me go back to where I was talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah, here it was. I was talking about the uh, elements and this particular uh, table, that, which I labeled S elements, D elements, and P elements, and the F elements will assist you to eventually uh, be able to write what we call the electron configuration. Okay, and the electron configuration configuration is a description uh, of which consists of numbers, which is the coefficient, the first number, which represents the energy level of that particular, uh, let's say, electron. So if I were to write something like 1s1, uh, that tells me that I might, I'm talking about the first energy level, the first orbit, and the superscript one on the orbit, the S orbit, means that I got one electron. So that would represent the electron configuration of hydrogen, okay? And as I go across the periodic table to helium, I know that the S orbit can only handle a maximum of two electrons, okay? And so if I wanted to write the electron configuration for helium, simply what I just wrote, again, I'm getting my internet connection is unstable. At this time, I don't know if it's me because uh, my hotspot is good or Zoom itself, okay? And so going to helium, I can simply just replace that one with the two, okay? And that is the electron configuration of helium. Notice I'm going across the periodic table. Now, when I go to lithium, lithium, guess what? I'm in the second energy level, okay? So I can put the number two here because I know I'm in the second energy level. Second thing I can do is I notice that I am in the first column of the S elements, right? So now I can put in the letter S, okay? Then the third thing I, I noticed is that obviously I got three electrons because this lithium is, is element number three. So two of those electrons have been filled because they're in the first energy level. And then notice the 1s2 I leave alone because that's where I'm going to put the first two electrons of, of lithium. And so I can't put any more. There's no, no such thing as s3. s2 is the maximum. So that one lone electron, the only place it can go is the next energy level, okay? And hence I got the two and also the next energy level, which is the S orbit. The two energy level, the S, the second period has both the, the S and the P, okay? I go S and S and P, and then the third can go S, excuse me, let me write, rewrite that. Okay, S, P, and D, and then S, P, D, and F, okay? And that kind of helps you out to remember when I'm at the energy level, which electron, which orbits I'm working with, okay? Somebody has their, their mic on and I'm getting reverb. <laughs> so, I think, yeah, that one. All right, Ooh, no, no, All right, so then uh, where I wrote, I got notice that lithium is in the first column. And then being in the first column, automatically I can say, okay, I put an S1. And there you go, using the periodic table, I automatically have written the electron configuration for lithium. And as I go across, keep going to the next one, beryllium, Guess what? All I got to do is change that to, 
the one into two. So it becomes 1s2, 2s2. Okay, and it's supposed to be a two. It's a terrible looking two there. And if you look at beryllium, it's element number four. Four protons, four electrons. I got a total of four electrons. Of those four electrons for beryllium, two of them, two of them are in the oneness energy level in the S orbit. And the other two are in the second energy level, also in the S2, okay, S orbit. And here's the cool thing. Now keep going across the periodic table, go to boron. Now you're in the P. You are still in the first, second energy level, but now you're getting to fill up the P orbits. Because remember, in the second energy level, you have S and P, S starting the far left, and as you go move, move across the groups 3A to 5, 8A, that's where you enter, enters the P, okay? So it would be like P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, and guess what? P6, I can write there to help me out to remember. All right, so on the second energy level, I've entered, I've entered the P element, so I can put a P there, and I'm in the first column of the P orbit, so I can simply put a one, superscript one there for the P. Count the superscripts, there are five, okay? Which consists with five electrons for boron, and so on down the line. So carbon, simply change that to a two, the P that is, go to carbon. Notice something here. The Roman numerals, as I go across, the Roman numeral, uh, the group that carbon is in is in group Roman numeral 4A. That tells you that for carbon, which has six electrons, of the six electrons, four of them are on the outermost shell. Can you see here that the outermost shell is second energy level? Of those four, Two of them are in the P orbit, and two of them are in the S orbit of the second energy level. So that Roman numeral on top is telling you how many valence electrons that group. And I say carbon, but that is consistent with everybody in this same group. And that is why everybody within a group behaves chemically very similar because they all share the one property of having the same number of valence electrons in the outermost shell. And even though the valence electrons of silicon are in the third energy level, okay, that's where silicon's at on the third energy level, it has still has four of them, but they happen to be in the third energy level. Okay, so you see the how, how we can use the periodic table to help you write the electron configuration. So, Tech, theoretic, not theoretically, you should be able to, if needed, say, go here and say, okay, write the electron configuration of this guy, number 39, bam. Using productivity, go bam, 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 you're done, okay? Because <laughs> you can see you're in the fifth energy level. You also are starting with the D elements. Remember the D elements, their energy level is one energy level than what it is in, so it becomes 4D, and it's in the first column, 4D1, okay? You're in, you're in the five, fifth energy level. All the ones from one through four get full, and then you start off with the five, 5S2, five and then 4D1 for the outermost shell. All right. So you can use the periodic table in that sense, and we'll do a few more examples, or you can use this, um, table here or to remind you how you fill up the energy levels, either using this diagram, notice it's 1s, okay, that's where you start up, 1s1 for helium, 1s2 for hydrogen, you're going across the periodic table, different energy levels, okay, you can use that, all written out is, is as follows, 1s, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and then remember the 3D kick in here, but only when you reach element number 21, okay? <clears throat> and so if 
if if you're not needing the uh, more energy levels, <coughs> excuse me, because that element doesn't have that number of electrons, you don't use the the whole thing. You don't use all that. Okay. All right. You don't use all the rest of the equations here, the numbers. Just just what you need. Okay, so if we take an, the example of carbon, the electron configuration of carbon is a 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, okay? Just like we uh, showed you, just like I showed you using the product table, that's what you come up with. What that tells you is this, uh, there, Periodic table, you look up carbon number six, you have six protons, uh, uh, six electrons, and guess what? Six neutrons for the most common isotope, okay? Of those six electrons, okay, one, two of them are in the very first energy level because you fill that energy level up first, okay? So that's the one is two. Then noting that you're in the P element in the second energy level, you're gonna start filling up in the second energy level, the S electrons, as you go across the S electrons, they get full. And then you start filling up the P's and carbon is in the second column of the B elements, okay? P elements. So now you got 2S2, 2P4. Also, the periodic table tells you that it, carbon is in group Roman numeral 4A, okay? Roman numeral 4A, which tells you that there are four valence electrons, and those electrons are, valence electrons are those electrons in the outermost energy level, outermost energy level. So of the six electrons, Okay, of the six electrons, carbon has, um, it has four of them in the outermost shell. And that is where all the action happens. That's where all the chemistry happens, okay? Now, with that bit of information, let me go to this. Can anybody tell me how many valence electrons does oxygen have? Valence electrons. Well, let me ask you this first. How many total electrons does oxygen have? Okay. And then how many valence electrons does oxygen have? It has eight, correct? It has eight uh, total or valence? A total. Yes. So then the valence electrons would be zero? Zero? No. Oh. Your group is it in? Oh, two. No. Right. Oh my God, I'm lost. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Would it have six? You are correct. All right, let's let's look at oh, you. Right. Because yeah, the let's... two in the first. Okay, I got it. You got Thank it. You. Okay, so total electrons is eight because that's the atomic number. Okay. Valence electrons, you just happen to look at the group number it's in. So it has six. So of the eight, okay. Uh, of the eight, six of them are on the outermost shell, okay? Now, electron configuration. Let's do it real quick using the periodic table. Let me erase this so we know, okay? So we're working with oxygen and oxygen, maybe the question says, what is the electron configuration of oxygen, okay? So you have two choices. You can go back to the slide. They showed you the sequence of of um, order, uh, filling them up, you can do that. Or you can use a periodic table and just very quickly figure out the electron configuration. First thing to notice, notice that the uh, oxygen is in the second period, okay? Second period, okay? So that means that the first period is full, right? Because we're, we're talking about oxygen here. So it has eight electrons. So the first period is full and we can very quickly write 1s2. That incorporates the electrons full that are full. 
in the first period. So it's 1s2. That incorporates both the electrons for hydrogen and helium. So we can quickly write that. We also note that oxygen is in the second energy level. Okay. And notice that we're, it is in the far right of the s elements. So the s orbitals are full. So we can write 2s2. And oxygen is a p element. Okay. Which tells you, all right, I got the, it's going to be 2p. It's a p element, and it's also still in the second energy level. Remember that the the orbits in the second energy level are just the s and the p. So that we can write two p. Now the question is, what is my number of electrons? Well, notice that I have oxygen is in the fourth column from the left, starting here. One, two, three, and four. So that is 2p4. So we wrote the electron configuration for oxygen very quickly. Verify that you write, that you have the correct number of superscripts. You should have the total of eight. So I got four plus two plus two, guess what? That's eight, okay? The valence electrons, which I said correspond to represent the, the ones in the outermost energy, and we can look at the group number that it's in and notice that it's in group Roman numeral six. And is it consistent with what we wrote in the electron configuration? Yes, because the second energy level is the most outermost energy level, okay? And that's two. And okay, of the six electrons, two of them are in the S orbit and the other four are in the P orbit. Okay, and guess what? If we were gonna do fluorine, you don't have to do much because that four up here becomes, anybody wanna take a guess and tell me what that number becomes for fluorine? We just did oxygen, let's move over one. What would this P be? I'm, I'm erasing. You got it. Five. Five, okay. Look at the group number that fluorine is in. It is in group seven, right? Which means that there are seven valence electrons. And I'm just messing it up here. Resolution of my pen is not the best. That's five. So five plus two is in that seven for fluorine, okay? And something else to gather from this. Remember I talked about it, said put in long-term memory, non-metals lose electrons, non-metals gain electrons. So fluorine has a tendency to gain one electron. Why? Because it can, it can accept one electron. Right now with the seven electrons, not a very stable state. That's why fluorine is, has to combine with another element of, of fluorine and become diatomic to make it stable. But by itself, fluorine without that extra electron tends to be not very stable. So fluorine, because it has room for it, has room for it in, in the P orbit to make it six. And when it gains one electron, it becomes fluoride. And it has the magical eight has been full. But more than that, more than that in a bit. We'll talk about that. Because the driving force here is that magical eight. And if you understand and look at the electron configuration, that's going to make sense to you. Because you can see that by either removing the electron, OK, that gets rid of that extra electron. And the next energy level in is full. And so therefore, that metal is now more stable. And here, hopefully, you can recognize that fluorine, by gaining one electron, makes it more stable because now it has eight electrons around the outermost shell, okay? And that is true for all, all the non-metals. They want to gain electrons, and they're going to gain anywhere from three to one electron to become more stable. Because if we look at the electron configuration, we just did fluorine, 
this dude finally number 10. Where do you think that P becomes number wise? For electron configuration for anyone want to take a guess? What does that P become? Pardon me? Become six. Six, you got it. Exactly. It's in the sixth column, remember? One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, in the sixth column. Okay. Now neon has eight valence electrons, does it not? And we, all, we also know that because it belongs in group eight. Okay. This is a true statement from neon down. Eight valence electrons, not true statement for helium because only two for helium, okay? But from neon down, eight. And those eight for helium are in the second energy level, okay? And there's eight va valence electrons. Six of them are in the P and two of them are in the S orbit of the second energy level. Now, the magical number of eight has been obtained in the case of neon. And when that happens, it is extremely stable, okay? If I wanna add one more electron to go to the next uh, element, which is sodium, guess what? I gotta add one more energy level. I can't add any more to the second energy level because I'm maxed out. I gotta kick it up to the next energy level. And if you look at sodium, sodium becomes 3s1. Okay, I'm going around the sodium here. Okay, see how I've been filling up the electron configuration? Sodium is in group 1A. It has one valence electron. And that happens to be right there in the 3s1 energy level. Sodium is a metal. So, you know, it, it, it has seven more electrons to put in to get that magical eight. That's not very energy uh, efficient. Okay, to pick up seven because it'd be extremely unstable. I got seven electrons to put in there, and and only uh, uh, we got uh, eleven protons. I'm gonna have eighteen electrons and and eleven protons. It just won't, you know, it won't. It's not very stable in that manner. But it's a metal, and like I stated before, all metals want to lose electrons. So sodium has a tendency to lose that electron that's sitting up there all by itself. And when it does that, guess what? The new energy level that is full is the next one in. And so now that has eight electrons, okay? So metals is a group, metals in groups one and one A and two A have that tendency to lose either one or two electrons so that they be, become, have eight electrons in the outermost shell which makes them into a more uh, stable situation. Your book talks about they'd be happy. Uh, I don't know if they're happy or not, but I can tell you they're more stable, <laughs> okay? All right, so this electron conf configuration, hopefully maybe it's less confusing now, but you can see it's a sequential process. It's not, you know, it's you just carry it across and work the first 20 elements. You see how the sequence going, you hopefully pick up on, on the trend and, and go, you know, grab a good grab a good understanding of this because that helps us understand why nonmetals gain electrons and metals tend to lose electrons. All right, so let's go back to that slide. And we, we just a rehash on this on the energy uh, levels sequence energy one only has one orbit, that's the S, that's it. So that's uh, that's hydrogen and, he and, and uh, helium, we're, uh, we're done with that, that's it. All right, the second energy level has both the S and the P. And then the third energy level has the S and the P, but then we introduce the D. And keep in mind that at the, at the third energy level state, that these D electrons come from the elements that are in the fourth energy level. Okay, starting with number 21. 
because when the mathematics is done for the d orbit, which again, I explained that these uh, orbits are nothing more than mathematical equations that describe a region of space where there's a probability of the electron being. And so when one undergoes mathematics, it turns out that, no, that for the, for the uh, fourth energy d elements, their orbits, d orbits, are actually one energy level closer in than the rest of them, the S and the P, which maintain in the fourth energy level. And the F, F energy level, similar situation, but instead of one, they come in twice. And so fourth energy level means that for these guys here, these are elements that were in the six period, six period, okay? Because again, these F orbits are mathematically shown that their energy level is less than the energy level that they actually exist in. But that's only true for the orbits. All right, so um, let me clear this up. All right, so this is a rehash of, that, of the slide I showed you where you uh, think of the first two rows as the S elements. Uh, the yellow ones here, think of them as the P. Uh, the ones inside uh, that are what, pinkish color and the greenish color, uh, think of them as the D and the F respectively. Now, where I, where I told you before that we can um, predict the charge of groups one and two, as far as the metals are concerned, we can't do that with these guys in here, okay? Because uh, with, with the first two, and there's no question about it. All the metals in group one will always lose one electron. All the metals in group two will always lose two electrons. The metals within the D elements, they have a special name here, they can vary. For example, copper, we have two, three types of copper. We have the element copper, which has a net charge of zero. Copper's right here, okay? But copper can lose one electron and end up with a plus charge. But copper can also lose two electrons and end up with a plus two charge. Another example would be iron. Okay, iron's in one of these metals is right there. Iron, pure iron is pure zero, so it's iron zero. But iron can lose two electrons and give me a plus charge, or it can lose three electrons and to get, end up with a plus three charge. And a lot, all these metals have a variety of charges that they can undergo. So we can't predict like we can with these over here as far as the charges is concerned, nor can uh, the, the carbon, uh, the ones here I've highlighted, those, these nonmetals we can predict uh, their respective negative charge. And we'll get into that, okay? To help us out to put compounds together. Notice how we can think about this. You know, I, earlier I said uh, uh, the fluoride, when it, it has a tendency to gain an electron, has a negative. We're going to put positive and negative together. These guys are called ions, both of them. Okay, the plus, and we got plus ions and negative ions. We're gonna put plus ions with negative ions together to make a compound. So you think about all the metals we have here and their charges, corresponding charges. We have the nonmetals, we can do mix and match. We can do copper chloride or fluoride or bromide, iron to iron chloride, iron fluoride, et cetera, all mix and match. Uh, we can start building up a whole, uh, uh, database, a pretty big, hefty database of chemical compounds that you can put together, okay? All right, so for sodium, we're going to do the electron configuration. So we got 1s1, okay? Sodium is, let me write this, mark it so you know where it's at. Okay. Sodium is right, right here, and we got one, two, and three. It's the third energy level. And so the one is two electrons are full, okay? 
And then we're going across the second energy level. And that means all the way across from left to right. So that means the 2S2 is full and the 2P6 is full. And so that is neon, okay, 2P6. So we come around, run around the horn, so to speak, get where sodium is. And guess what? It's in the third energy level. So we can quickly put 3S1, okay? It is in group one, it has one valence electron. And that one valence electron is in the third energy level, okay? All right, oxygen, oxygen is over here, second, second energy level. Well, you know, we can very quickly, let me do this manually to demonstrate what, what I mean by using the uh, periodic table. And so I got the one where I marked the periodic table with uh, the period, the energy level, one, two, and three, okay? I won't go almost go any further. One, two, and three. So oxygen is in the second energy level. That means that the one S is full and the two S and we got two P, okay? So I can write those down without the superscripts, and then I just come back and fill in the superscripts. Oxygen has uh, a total of, um, I'm having a hard time, eight electrons. So I got here, one is two, I can do very quickly two. Okay, that fills up the energy level, the first energy level. And then that fills up that and that. And I go to this two S that fills that part. So those are full. And then notice that I am in the fourth column from the left of the P. So I can go very quickly, put that down. So its electron configuration is 1S2, 2, 2S2, 2P4, okay? Using the periodic table. Okay. Minus two, two S two, two P four. Verify it. I got eight electrons, and there are six valence electrons. Oxygen's in group six. I got six valence electrons. Of those six valence electrons, two of them are in the two S orbital, and the other four are in the two P orbit. Okay. Let's do calcium. Calcium is right here. It's in the third energy level. And guess what? It's in the second column. All right, being the third energy level, I can very quickly write 1s, 2, 2s, and 2p. And then I'm in the third energy level and in the second column. So it's right there. I can put 3s2, second column. The rest is a matter of just filling in the numbers. We know that max S is two, max S is two, max P is six, okay? So I got six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Is in calcium number 12? Yes, it is. It's got 12 valence electrons. It is in group two, A. It's got two valence electrons, okay? Now, given the information you have, what can you deduce? What can you give me the best guesses when calcium being a metal, it's going to lose an electron or electrons? Can you tell me what you think? How many electrons will calcium lose? And what will be its charge once it loses whatever number you state? Okay, who wants to give, a, give that a shot? Let's try first one. How many electrons would calcium lose? One? Uh, not quite. Not okay. quite. Yeah, what group is it in? Uh, calcium is in group, I gotta make it bigger on your screen. It's oh. in group, sorry. It's okay. It's so tiny. Yeah. I mean, no, not group six, I'm talking about group two. 
Group two, okay, what does that tell you? How many electrons are there? It's gonna lose two of them. You got it, okay? So if it loses two electrons, because it's in group two, what would be his new charge? If I lose two negative, if I be, if I lose some negativity, it's gonna be positive. Positive. What number would you think it would be? Two. You got it. All right, and that is the calcium you ingest when you when you are eating vitamins or whatever milk, drinking milk. That is what's going down your body. You're not ingesting the element. You are ingesting the ion, the element that has lost those two electrons because. In losing those two electrons, I'm a little bit ahead of myself here, but you know, this will help when we get to that, that part. In losing those two electrons, those two on the outermost shell are lost, okay? And guess what? The next energy level that calcium has is full with that happy eight, if you will. It has eight electrons now, in its outermost shell, which is, is the next one in, which it makes it more stable, okay? And now take one more piece of information and, and, and infer from it from this, all right? We talked about the energy levels being in different, in different values from energy level one, two, and three, okay? So the diameter of one, that is the diameter energy level one, obviously is, is smaller than that of energy level two, the data energy level number three, all the way up to seven, okay? Now, if calcium loses those two electrons, do you anticipate that the radius of the ion would be bigger or smaller than what it originally started as. Smaller. You got it. And so the radius is smaller because that higher energy level, it's like taking off a layer of an onion. If I take up, you know, the outermost layer of an onion and remove it, and that's the outermost layer of this onion, which is calcium, contains two electrons, and I get, them, get rid of them, and they're no longer there. Well, the new radius of that onion is the next energy level in. And so the radius of the ion is smaller than the radius of the initial element, okay? And those are some of the properties of ions and what's happening. Again, it's brought to you by these electrons that are occurring. Now, if that, that is correct, what does that infer? Think about this, that if an element were to gain electrons, you think that the radius would get bigger or smaller or stay the same if you gain an electron? We just concluded correctly that when you lose electrons, you get smaller because the next energy level is, is in. But what do you think might be happening when you gain an electron to the radius of that element? Would it get bigger or smaller? We keep it in mind that it's gaining in a, in a negative component. And it's got seven, for example, the ones in fluoride has seven negative components in there, and now I'm going to add another negative. What do you think might happen? I can tell you, the radius gets bigger, because the negatives, they repel from each other. You got seven in there already for, say, fluorine and chlorine, everybody group seven, and as they gain one more electron, because it has room for one more electron, well, the electrons repel each other. And so the radius of the ion, of the new material, gets bigger, okay? So the negative charge ions get bigger, the positive charge ions get smaller, okay? All right, let's clear my mess up. I'm running off my... Uh, my hotspot up my phone. Do you see any difference uh, compared to Cox? You're not breaking up. No, that's good. <laughs> Maybe I ought to just stay my stay on my phone. 
All right. Okay. So, Calcium, we just did that. Well, 1s2, 2s2. Remember that the coefficient is the energy level. The letter is the orbit. Okay. And the superscript is the electron in that particular orbit. So, calcium has um, uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, uh, excuse me, and 3s2. Okay. Uh, see, oh, I forgot. Um, and 3p6 and 4s2. Got ahead of myself here. I was jumping up to chlorine. All right, so chlorine. Chlorine, where are we at? Chlorine's over there, right underneath fluorine. So, marking it to give you an idea where it's at. Uh, right there. We're still in the third energy level. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5, okay? 3p5. Notice that chlorine is in group seven and therefore has seven valence electrons. In fact, look at the trend. Everybody in group seven, everybody will have seven valence electrons. The difference is chlorine has it in the third energy level. Fluorine had them in the second energy level. Bromine will be the what one through fourth energy level, et cetera. Okay, but they all share the same property. They happen, happen to have seven electrons, valence electrons in the outermost shell. It's just that going in the periodic table, the, the smaller one is here, the next one, next one, next one, next one. Second of all, they're in group seven, they're non-metals, they want to gain electrons, and by gaining electrons, now they fill up that, that P5, because there's six, there's room for six elements, electrons in that P orbit. So there's room for one more. And when it does that, now has a negative charge ion. All right. This kind of breaks it down for you, helps you out. Now, for chem, for chem 130, uh, let me clear this up. When we go from in the D, we go D1 all the way to D10 sequentially, regardless of what's happening here. There are areas that, that are not sequential you know, beyond the scope of the class. And there's a reason why. There's a D3 here and it jumps to D5. Okay, we're not gonna obviously talk about that at this level. It's an interesting thing, I wish you could, but you have to learn a lot more stuff before we get into that. So for our purposes, we just keep it sequential from D1 to D, D10 as we talk about these inner ones. Notice that the green, you got the three energy level, okay? So the Ds are in one energy level than the period that they're in. This is period uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, okay? And so element number 21 is in the fourth energy level, but the D electrons begin at the third energy level. And the same is true for the F, okay? The way the uh, periodic table is, is, is given, if you notice that there's like a two, these two rows in the bottom that are called the F elements, uh, they really belong in sequence right here. And what happens is they take them out. Otherwise, I do have a picture here. I'll show you when we get the, the periodic table of this periodic table with those two rows inserted. And what that does, it spreads that periodic table pretty large, pretty wide. So what they do is take those out and bring it in to, to make it more visual, more easy, easy to read. But notice that, again, the point of this one is to tell you how the electron configurations work with respect to their uh, energy level. As I was stating for the P's, if we ever do a P, we should go, go sequentially from F1 to F14. As in the case of the D, it's not always sequential. Here we got seven going to nine, you know, 11, and, you know, and then 14 at 14. And there's a lot of stuff going on here that we're not going to talk about. But if we ever have to talk to do electron configuration for one of the S or one of the Ds, 
is treated sequentially regardless of where it's at in the periodic table. Okay. Uh, so you can help help out, you can help you to use the graph on top. And again, what we give you down here with respect to this diagram. Okay, so noble gases, that's the ones in the far right column during period 8A and are very stable. Happy, uh, that's a subjective thing. I don't know if they're happy, but I can tell you they're stable. They're called noble gases because they're very unreactive. And they're very unreactive simply because that magical eight has been obtained. There's eight electrons. Why that magical eight? That, that's, that is the mathematics that came out of all this quantum mechanic business. And eight is, is the optimum number of electrons that add, add stability. With the exception of helium, remember that top right helium, its magical number is two because it can't handle any more electrons than two. Helium's only got two electrons. So this magical eight is called the octet rule or the duet rule for helium and hydrogen, okay? Here's helium. Its electron configuration is uh, 1s2, all right? Valence electrons, as I stated, they, they are the outermost level electrons, okay? They are the outermost layer of an onion. There's multiple layers on the onion. The valence uh, onion molecules are in the outermost shell of that onion. That's what they are here. And having said that, that is where all the action occurs. That is where all, all the chemistry is occurring in the outermost shell. Because again, it's, it, Mother Nature is, is, is Mother Nature and is going to take the least route of resistance when it comes to chemical reactions. And so these electrons that are, are interacting uh, are the outermost shell. Okay, That's the least energy. To pull out an electron from the inside, leaving the outermost shell alone, not not very uh, energetically favored. Those are called poor electrons, okay? Those are those electrons that are full and are in the inter innermost shell. Now, if we take a look at phosphorus and write the electron configuration for phosphorus, you have the following. You have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3, okay? Excuse me. You notice that phosphorus is in the third energy level. And so that is the outermost shell for phosphorus. It's in group five, A, Roman number five. So there's five valence electrons. Those five valence electrons, of those five valence electrons, th two of them exist in the S orbit of the third energy level. And the other three are in the P orbit of the third energy level, okay? The core electrons over the innermost shell are denoted here by red. Notice something here. Phosphorus is a nonmetal. So phosphorus has a tendency to want to gain electrons. Now, can anybody tell me what you can deduce, and having just stated that, that phosphorus is a nonmetal and it's going to gain electrons to create what we call an ion, okay? It's not the element anymore. Once you gain or lose this electron, it's no longer an element, it becomes an ion. Can anybody tell me here, what do you predict the number of electrons that phosphorus will gain? Okay. Three. And Three, exactly. Why? Because we got room for three. If the P3 has, you know, those three can go in there. Now, can you tell me what will be the net charge now when it gains three electrons? Negative. Negative what? You got to you got to give a magnitude. Three. You got it. And so we got phosphorus three and phosphorus zero. Phosphorus zero is the element. Okay. Phosphorus negative three is the ion, and it's a negative three because it 
is a nonmetal and it has room for three electrons and therefore it gained three electrons. Think about it. Would it be from an energy, ask yourself the question, would it be from an energy perspective easier to lose five electrons, those five here in the valence shell, or to pick up three? Well, obviously to pick up three, okay? And once it picks up three, guess what? Now the electrons had the same configuration as a noble gas, which would be argon, okay? If you look at argon, sorry, I had something lying here. Argon, we got fourth energy level is 4p6, or 3p6, excuse me. <clears throat> okay. And now it's stable. So phosphorus, by picking up three electrons, okay, now uh, it has a negative three charge, has an electron configuration now of argon gas, and that is the gas in front of it. You know, so now, um, the other aspect about this three is that also tell you tells you how many bonds phosphorus can make down the road. We're gonna have to we're gonna learn well how many bonds chemical bonds can phosphorus make? Well, it will gain that number three because it's in groups eight to five correlates with the number of bonds it's going to make. Okay. All right. Good. So there's a lot of lot of stuff again from, from the periodic table. We we're gonna pull from the help help us understand all that. So we got that's supposed to be a question mark. So we got chlorine, uh, beryllium, and aluminum. Okay, and so here the electron configuration you might want to go through it and, and verify are given as follows is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and 3p5. As the case of phosphorus, which is a nonmetal, chlorine is a nonmetal. And so here chlorine is going to pick up, guess what? One electron to give it, because it's got room for one to fill up that p orbit. Okay. Here's beryllium, 1s2, 2p2. Okay, beryllium is a nonmetal. And so the valence electrons it's going to lose are in the outermost shell. Okay, so it's going to kick them off. Remember, you might say, well, wait a minute, it's, why would it get two? Remember, the second energy level it also has the P. They're empty, the P's are empty, but that beryllium has to maintain that P area too even though they're empty. So from energy perspective, it's easier just to give up those two electrons and don't have to deal with any energy levels in the second energy level and just deal with the first one, okay? First energy level. And then we got aluminum, which is uh, its electron configuration is a 1s2, 2p2, 2p6, 3s2, and 3p1. And so, the valence electrons here for aluminum are in the third energy level. Guess what? Aluminum is in uh, enter, uh, Roman numeral 3A, it has three valence electrons. Now, anybody want to take a guess uh, if aluminum will gain or lose electrons? What do you guys think? Lose. Lose because it's a metal. Remember that. Never lose track of that. It's a metal. Now, good. Now, how many will how many will it lose? I'm gonna say I'm gonna say one. Mm -hmm. How many valence three. electrons? Three. You got it. So it's gonna lose those three. Remember that three third energy level can handle a total of how many electrons? Eight. Right. In the third in the third energy level, it can handle. Well, let, let, let's enter this. Oh, let me do this. Three is fine. So, what's the charge in aluminum before I, I, I go on? What's the final charge once it loses those three electrons? Positive. Positive what? You gotta you gotta have a magnitude. Positive eight. No. How many did it lose? I mean six. I mean positive three. You're right. You're got it. Positive You're three. Got it. Positive three. So that is the charge of the ion. Aluminum, the element has a zero. Okay. But the ion is 
at positive three because it lost those three valence electrons. So let's 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 talk about this for a second. In the first energy level, remember there's only an s orbit. That's it. So the max energy the max number of electrons that the first energy level, not the, not the orbits, but the energy level, the maximum number of electrons that energy level number one, that's a period across encompassing hydrogen and helium is two, that's it. Now go to the second period. Well, the second period, we have the S and the P orbits only, okay? And so the max I can put in the S obviously is two. I'm gonna put a two there. And the max for the P I can put a six. That means that the max, maximum number of electrons I can put in all of that second energy level would be eight. Eight maximum electrons, that's it. Now here, here it comes a little bit trickier. We get into the third energy level. So what do we have there orbit wise? Yes, we have the S. Yes, we have the P, but now we have the D, right? So the S max is two, the P's max is six. How about the D? Everybody remember what's the maximum number of electrons I can put it in the orbit itself for the D? Ten. You got it. Okay, so 10 plus six plus two plus two says that in this third energy level, full period across, the maximum number of electrons that I can put in that energy level in the third is 18. Electron number 19, guess where it goes? Into the next energy level, number four, okay? And then let's do finally the fourth one and we'll call it a day here. The fourth energy level, yes, has the S. It also has the P, six. It also has the D, which is the 10. And guess what? That's where the F comes into play. How many can we put in the F? Max. I don't remember. I thought it was 14, but I don't remember. Well, I know you thought right. <laughs> 14. Oh, great. Okay. So you got 14 there for the F. Okay. Remember the numbers one, five, uh, one, one, I'm sorry, one, three, five, and seven. One for the S, because there's only one S orbit. There are three P orbits. There are five D orbits, and there are seven F. F as in Fred, okay, orbits. Each one can handle two. So that means I got two for the S, six for the P, 10 electrons maximum for the D, and 14 for the F, okay? So now I'll let you do the final math for the fourth energy level. What is the maximum number of electrons I can put in in the fourth energy level? was 14 plus 10 plus six plus eight. Nobody want to take a 14 plus 38. 10, 31. Eight. Oh, I did. It was 10 plus six plus eight. Yeah, it's eight. You get 10, uh, 14 plus 10, 24, plus mm -hmm. 6, 30. Oh, I thought you meant added on. Oh, no, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was but, like, uh, no, my, then it may be my mistake if I stated it wrong, but the maximum number of electrons that you can put in the fourth energy level is 32. Okay. Because you got to put, okay. Which means if you have an element that, that that number has 33 electrons, you gotta hop up to the next energy level, you get you into the fifth energy level. Okay, so don't mistake the questions because they, it can be confusing sometimes is this, when they, they ask, well, what is a maximum number of electrons a P orbital can have? 
Well, P's, there's only three P's, each one can handle two, so six. But if they say, what is the maximum number of electrons at the third energy level? Okay, well, you have to figure out and remember, well, how many orbits do I have in the third energy level? And that is SPD. And then remember how many uh, electrons maximum I can put in each orbit. So you got 18. Okay. So make sure you distinguish in the question are they talking about the orbit or are they talking about the energy level? All right. Um, that I can knock this out. Well, we'll stop it here. And where are we at? We are on slide 32. Any questions? Yeah, practice on the, uh, figure out the electron configuration. 